Let us join together in prayer as we come to hear God's word read and interpreted this morning. Let us pray. Holy God, we give you thanks for the opportunity to gather around your word once again, to hear it spoken into our lives, to open our hearts to what you have to say for us in the Scripture, around the Scripture, however you may choose to speak into our lives during this time this morning. Open us to be receptive, that we may grow as your people day by day. In Christ's name, amen. Well, I invite you to hear the word first from Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. Uh, What we will be hearing is the aftermath of the eating of the fruit in the Garden of Eden. They, that would be Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman, the the woman whom you gave me to be with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree, and, and I ate. And then the Lord God said to the woman, What is it that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. Second text for this morning comes from Mark chapter 3, verses 20 through 35. And then he, that is Jesus, went home. And the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him. For people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of demons he cast out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Thanks be to God for the reading and the hearing and the meditation of his word. And now, O God, may the words of my heart and uh, mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 
Well, I've been preaching through the lectionary over the last better part of the time since we began the pandemic. The lectionary, that three-year series cycle of texts that kind of challenges and invites us as pastors to continue preaching through much, if not all, of Scripture. And, and as I looked at this Genesis and this Mark text, it, it seemed to me that a theme that connected them was the question of what is God up to here? What's, what's God doing in this passage? In Genesis 2, we, we get a depiction of God that's different from that of Genesis 1. Genesis 2 and 3 together, different from Genesis 1. You may remember Genesis 1, the, the passage that uh, begins in creation in, in talking about God being over this formless void and then saying, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw it and said that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And then God said, let there be a, a dome to separate the waters above from the waters below. Uh, and there was a dome and God saw it and said that it was good. And that was day two. And day three, let the waters below be gathered together in one place. And God saw that it was good. Day three. God is creating with a, a snap of the fingers like a, a great and mighty king. God doesn't have to, to, to sweat at all. God doesn't have to exert God's self at all. God just says it, and it happens. I was weeding all day Friday, and I don't have much snap in my fingers right now. But, but God had a snap in his fingers, and, and it took nothing in order to create Genesis 2 and 3 tells a, a different kind of story about God. It, it's not a God who is mighty and distant and just dictates and things happen. It's a God that is, is close, that is intimate, and that gets his hands dirty with creation. A God that scoops up soil and begins to gently, carefully, lovingly form it into a human, and then he breathes his own spirit, he exhales his own breath, his own ruach, into this thing that he's just created, and it comes to life with his life coursing through its veins. Genesis 1 saying he made it in his own image. And, and this being, God creates, and he, and he looks around and, and says, this world is too plain and creates a beautiful garden in which this being is set, and then begins creating all kinds of animals to be companions to this being, and says, these animals are not enough, and takes a bone out of that very being, and shapes and forms it, and breathes his own life into that, and makes woman, and he gives to that being a partner for it. So it's, it's this image of a very intimate God who gets his hands dirty in creation. But once you start getting your hands dirty in creation, it leads into more getting of the hands dirty. And so these creations that God has made in God's own image, that God has breathed God's own spirit into, only have one rule to obey. And they rebel against even that. They rebel against their God, against their maker, the one who had poured God's own self so lovingly, so tenderly, so intimately into. And then they hide because they're ashamed. And so what is God up to in this passage? God realizes that the relationship is broken. God enters the scene, walking in the garden, seeking out broken humanity, and beginning the process of confronting, forgiving, and restoring the relationship. I, I picture God walking in the garden, knowing that Adam and Eve are hiding, and it's kind of like the game of hide-and-seek between an adult and a three-year-old where the adult never doesn't know where the three-year-old is, but still asks, where are you? I can't find you. 
Humans, on the other hand, they're hiding. They're blaming others. They're ashamed of their action. They're fearful of staying engaged with God. And we realize the story, though a very old story, tells a very common tale that we live out over and over again in our own lives. And I can't help but wonder if Adam and Eve, these people in this scenario, uh, perhaps have an image like the third slave in Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30, that, that center parable in Matthew 25, the one we call the, the parable of the talents. You may remember the master goes away and leaves his three slaves in charge of all that he has, and to one he gives five talents, and to another two, and to another one. And, and the first two, they, they double those talents over the time that the master's away. The third one hides him, uh, the, his talent in a hole in the ground. And when the master returns, the third one explains why. He says, I knew you were a harsh master reaping where you do not sow and, and gathering where you did not scatter seed. And so I was afraid and I hid my talent. I, I hid your, your talent in the hole in the ground. Here, have what is yours. And it turns out that the, the slave's depiction of God was what led to the wrong kind of behavior. If the slave had understood, if Adam and Eve had understood that God was gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, might not this story have played out differently? Might not they have been people who would have realized their error and sought out restoration with the God that is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and, instead of hiding? And, and thinking maybe it would go away. There would be consequences for the actions later on in this story. But those consequences as well lie within the love and the grace of a God that would never let go of God's own creation. Life would be different, but it would still be lived within the love and grace of God. When we look, look at Mark chapter 3, it's again interesting to ask the question, what is God up to here? What is God doing? We know here 2,000 years after this story that in Jesus, God was reconciling the world to himself. As we read this passage alongside Genesis chapter 3, we also see that God was getting God's own hands dirty with creation all over again. He's entering the scene, walking the earth with his creation, seeking out broken humanity, and beginning the process of confronting, forgiving, and restoring the relationship. This time, though, rather than hiding in shame, at the misdeed that they know they've done, the humans represented here by the scribes, the humans instead have become confident in their perspectives, making themselves to be righteous, freely judging others for how far those people diverge from themselves. And so God enters the scene in Jesus, healing, challenging, calling all to repentance, so that the relationship might be restored. Humans fail to recognize God, though, and they continue to make themselves the standard by which others can be judged. Impressed with their own power, the scribes condemn him. Fearful of human power, his own family seeks to restrain him. Unable to comprehend him, some in the crowds were saying, he's gone out of his mind. In the midst of the swirling conflict in the fallen garden, Jesus proclaims that whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. And so hear the good news. 
When you ask the question to yourself, what is God up to in the world today, now? What is God doing? Hear the good news that God is constantly getting God's own hands dirty with creation intimately involved in our lives, seeking out us when we are broken humanity, calling our names, bringing us out of hiding and shame so that we may be restored and forgiven and set back on a right path with God. Our nature is to rebel against God, to become fearful, to become arrogant, to think we know better. And yet, God continues to seek us out and promises and shows that in Christ we can become new creations. New creations that somehow have a bit more ability to catch ourselves when we fall, to turn back to God and seek forgiveness. The way forward is paved with ahas, times of recognition that we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, a repeated need to respond in repentance, and the constant presence of the God who's willing to get God's own hands dirty with us, intimately involved, shaping, forming, redeeming, restoring. Let us pray. Holy God, we pray that you would help us to continually grow in self-awareness, able to catch ourselves in our own arrogance, able to recognize when we're hiding in shame, And that you would help us to come to you more quickly. Looking at you not as the one who is a harsh master. Reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. Seeing you instead as the one who is gracious and merciful. Slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The one who is willing to go to any means of getting your hands dirty in creation, even stretching out your hands, that we may come to know the depth and the power of your love, that we may learn to be quicker at seeking you out and seeking to be restored with you, that we may come to live more fully as the people and the community that you have called us to be. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.